today's event is what we're calling the coaching spotlight. And I suppose the idea with this is part of what we do in the coaching SIG is to try and build community and a platform for members to discuss and forward coaching psychology and coaching. Uh, so to this end, we are going to host a series of these spotlight events created to highlight interesting research, interesting work, interesting projects and applications of coaching and coaching psychology in our communities and our organizations and our educational institutions. So we reached out to members of the SIG and others in the coaching uh, psychology community and the response has been really, really positive. And so we're going to host a series of these over the next year. Uh, so if you'd like to come and speak and you have and speak about some interesting research or some interesting coaching psychology work that you're doing, please get in touch. Uh, so today's speakers are going to be the wonderful Zelda de Blasi, Julie McCall, and Mary Vallette Devine. Uh, Zelda and Julie are both from UCC, um, so they both teach on the Masters in Positive Psychology and Coaching Psychology. Um, Zelda is co-director and she's also a certified health and wellness coach with the Institute of Health Sciences and HeartMath. And uh, Julie is a positive psychology coach, trainer and facilitator, and she specializes in positive leadership, strengths, team development, and positive psychology. So I'm gonna hand you over to Zelda and Julie, and we'll be talking to uh, Mary a little bit later. Sorry, Lorna, everything okay? <laughs> Thanks, okay. Jason. So if you, if you stop sharing, then I can, I can share. Mm -hmm. So, hello everybody, um, welcome. If you could just give me one second and I'm going to start sharing my screen. Can I just check with everybody that you can all see that? Thank you, Lorna, I'm getting a thumbs up from Lorna, so that's fantastic. So, uh, welcome, um, I'm thrilled, um, myself and Zelda are thrilled to be given the opportunity to, pre to present to you today. And thank you, Jason, um, very much for organising the event. It's um, we're very excited to, to be talking about our research today. So what I wanted to do just for, for a few brief minutes is really just to talk to you, or give you the backstory behind the research that we're going to be uh, sharing with you today. So I'm a runner. Um, I've been running marathons for about 15 years now, and um, my training sessions have always been with friends. Um, and I realized when I thought about those training sessions that actually they weren't just training sessions, they were actually coaching sessions. We ran, I listened, they talked, I asked some questions, they talked some, some more, and hey presto, solutions were found, problems were resolved, and goals were achieved. So I started thinking to myself, I, asked, I started asking myself some questions. The first question I asked was, can I bring together the two things I love to do in life, which is physical activity and coaching? Can I bring those two things together? And the answer to that was yes. And as a result of that, coaching on the move as a concept was born. And the second question I asked myself was, is there a link between physical activity and the the fact that my, my fellow run, runners uh, could actually become more solution focused as a result of, of that activity. And, and those that's basically going to be the purpose of, of today. I'm going to be sharing with you some of the research that Zelda and I have uh, been lucky enough to, to, be, to be party to. So that's the backstory. So let me pose a question to you. How do you think as a species we're getting on in relation to physical activity? Well, unfortunately, the answer to that or the short answer to that is not very well. As you can see there from, you know, our, our hunter gatherer, gatherer ancestors were great in terms of their physical movement and activity. Unfortunately, modern day life means that we as a, as a species, we are sitting for much longer. Our lifestyles are so sedentary. In fact, what the research is saying is that we're actually sitting for nine hours a day which is more time than we spend sleeping. Can you imagine that? And, you know, I'm sure you've seen, and as you can see that little um, icon in the corner that actually smoking has actually become, so sitting has become the smoking of our generation, which is shocking. And as we know that activity or the lack of activity actually has awful negative consequences in terms of obesity, cardiovascular disease, cancer, and diabetes. So. So the question is, 
what can we do as coaches to actually perhaps perhaps help with that and the suggestion I would put or pose to you today is perhaps to think about can you as coaches integrate physical activity into your own coaching practice. So the concept of walking and creative thinking and the power of that actually has been around for, for many years, in fact for a very long time. The Polish, um, the German I should say philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, said all truly great thoughts are conceived while walking and he's not alone or he wasn't alone. In fact modern day thinkers um, and great um, you know people like the late uh, Steve Jobs and Mark Zuckerberg um, Bill Gates, um, Richard Branson are all great fans of walking meetings. In fact, the Google a CEO said, um, let me read his quote to you, even though it's only a short one. The, uh, the CEO of Google said, to think I have to start walking. And Bill Gates' um, wife, Melinda, actually said that Bill does his best thinking whilst he's walking. The question is, is Boris doing his best thinking whilst he's walking. And I wonder what Leo, I wonder how, how Leo is getting on coaching him. So this concept isn't, you know, has, has been around for a very long time. So I'd like you to just hold those thoughts a second and I'm going to hand over to, to, to Zelda so she's going to do an activity with you. Thank you, Julie. Um, so thank you for giving that context and the fact that we spent so long sitting and often in front of computers. So the invitation now, especially for those of you who maybe have been sitting a lot this morning, is to, if you could, um, maybe stand up and... Great, thanks, Julie. <laughs> and everyone else, I can't see you, but the idea would be to ground your feet. Um, we're gonna do a kind of a standing pose that in yoga we call Tadasana and, or mountain pose, which is um, the foundational pose for all standing. Uh, poses and the idea is to take a nice deep in breath so as you inhale bringing the arms up above your head and slowly exhaling bring your arms back down and we just do that another couple of times so take a nice deep inhale and slowly exhaling any stresses and anything you want to release back down into the ground. And now we're gonna actually bring it up a little bit and we're gonna start moving just for a few seconds. And the idea is to do a few jumping jacks, which are a little bit like what we were just doing. <laughs> and this is a nice aerobic activity. And hopefully you have the space to be able to do this at home. <laughs> and bring it back down. Ah, so take a few nice breaths and just maybe notice if that changed um, either your energy levels or your mood. And breathing out. Thank you. Um, I think we're gonna move on to now the research. Um, yeah. But yeah, so but before um, mentioning about the research, we just wanted to give you a kind of a felt sense of what it might be like to get up and breathe and move. And what's really interesting when myself and Julie started having those conversations about how about we actually test uh, the effectiveness of walking coaching in different contexts, we discovered that hardly anything had been done in this field, which is really interesting considering that there's lots of research on the effects of nature lots of research on the effects of exercise um, and actually very little research on bringing together whether it's walking meetings or coaching and walking uh, and that's how we decided to actually let's go and look into this. So our first piece of research um, was with in an organizational setting in Cork where were we asked actually I'll, I'll let Julie give you the background to that first. Okay okay thanks Zelda. So Sorry, I'm just grabbing my chair back because after, after I was jumping up and down there. Glad to say I'm not out of breath. Um, we were lucky enough, actually, myself and Brenda Roach, who I work with, um, we were doing some positive leadership training for a large organisation in, in Cork. And um, as part of that programme, they actually agreed to do a pilot study with us. 
And what they agreed to look at was the difference between having one-to-one -one manager direct report meetings whilst walking, as opposed to having that one-to-one -one meeting sitting in an office. So that was basically the concept of the, of, of the, the research that we did. And uh, thank, I mean, what was, what was fantastic was both Brenda and uh, Zelda and I were actually given the opportunity to, pre to present that paper um, at the ISCP uh, back in March 2018. What was funny was actually when we were presenting that, that paper, we got everybody in the audience to stand up and, and do those jumping jacks. <laughs> Stephen Palmer, poor thing, was out of breath at the end, which was quite funny. Anyway, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hand over to, to Zelda and she's, she's actually going to, uh, she's gonna share that, the findings from that research with you. Yeah, so what I should mention is what we, um, what we had was 12 participants originally um, in this cohort and then we followed them up one year and we had nine altogether, but there were 12 participants, um, I think just two men. And what we asked them to do is to, um, after going through the ethics, uh, obviously, we asked them to fill out these questionnaires that measure their levels of self-esteem and self-efficacy, um, their stress levels, and then their mood. Um, and do you want to go next? Um, yeah. Perfect, so they, they were our baseline measures basically. And then the, they all had their first coaching meeting with their managers in May and in, um, they were all basically sitting during that period. Straight after their sessions, they were asked to fill out the same questionnaires. And then the following month, they were all invited to have their coaching session while walking. And again, straight after that, they were asked to, to basically fill out the questionnaires. And uh, in July, all back to sitting uh, sessions and again, fill out the, the same questionnaires. And, and then in August, they were all invited to walk and coach. Um, and we took then their, their kind of follow-up measures. What was, what was kind of slightly different in this study, maybe from other summers, is that we probably had one of the best summers ever. And it appears like every time they went walking, the weather was particularly nice, which is something to kind of bear in mind when we look at the findings. Um, so this is the journal of self-efficacy, which is this idea from Bandura that if you believe you can do something, you can do it. So this, this, this sense of uh, self-efficacy, as you can see at the baseline, it's, it was quite low. And then after the walking sessions, it kind of went up a little bit, but it seems to be pretty, kind of much higher when they're walking. Uh, and this might be something that if any of you have gone on walking coaching meetings before, you might have more of that sense that comes along with the sense of energy and, and movement towards a goal. And you're walking with, um, you know, your manager or your, or, or your coach walking towards that, that goal. So the next slide is looking at self-esteem. And there's a big jump from baseline to the follow-up, um, especially after the, the last walking coaching meeting. Um, so the end, that was a significant uh, effect. And then the next slide is a really interesting measure. If any of you, you may, might, may not have come across this measure, but it's looking at, it's known as CARE, consultation and relational empathy. And it's the extent to which um, it's used a lot in medicine. And the idea is patients believe, feeling that their doctors really listened to them and really cared for them, really paid attention um, and were genuinely interested. So we adapted the measure in the context of coaching uh, and ask them to what extent you feel like your manager, coaching manager, uh, really listened, you know, paid attention, was really interested in all of these. There's about 10, 10 items. And you can see that there's a trend for it to be slightly higher um, and significantly higher on the last walking coaching session, which we find particularly interesting um, in, the set, in the context of uh, an organizational setting to have to, for an employee to feel that their manager really truly cared for them and particularly ha having walked since this is one of the number one reasons for people giving up their jobs is feeling that maybe their their their, their manager doesn't really care um so and then the next slide is yeah just to give you a little sort of feel for this second study that we published recently in the journal of, of eco psychology uh, and let julie give you the backdrop to this for the I, I'm, I'm, I'm the person with the backstory. The backstory. We've always got a backstory. <laughs> so the backstory to this is I want to take you back to March where are we, 2020, which was obviously the start of the, um, the pandemic. And as you know, when COVID hit uh, for 
for many people, myself included, actually my you know work just evaporated. And unfortunately, uh, like many people, I actually had to sign up for the pub. Um, and for me, I didn't want to be idle. So I started thinking to myself, OK, how can I give back? And I thought to myself, well, OK, I can't necessarily coach people as in an office or even walking because, of course, we couldn't we couldn't go outside of whoops, sorry, outside of our particular restriction zone at the time. So I thought to myself, OK, I can't do that. But what perhaps what I could do is offer the um, opportunity to clients that I've worked with to actually have some telephone coaching. So. I walk in my space and, and they work in, in, in theirs. And I got chatting to Zelda and I was telling her what I was doing. And she said, that's fantastic. Why don't we take the opportunity to actually complete another piece of research in relation to that topic? And as you can see there, we've been lucky enough to work with Stephen Palmer. And actually that piece of research has, um, has just been published in the Journal of Eco Psychology, which is really exciting for all of us. So, as I said, what we did, um, just to, this is a visual representation, that's me on the right and one of my coaching clients, and she said she didn't mind her photo being here. So, I would literally walk with my telephone and my AirPods, and so would the client, and we would actually walk in our separate space. And there were some really interesting findings that came out from that, which, which Zelda's going to share with you in a second. But just before she does that, just to give you an idea of the type of environment the clients were walking in, this is a picture of Crosshaven. Um, close to where I live and where one of the clients was living. And as you can see, lots of green space next to the sea, close to nature. So very, very um, creative thinking um, environment was, was generated. So I'm going to hand over to Zelda now, who's going to share the findings of that research with you. Yes, so thanks, Julie. Um, what we wanted to give you is just more of a sense from the qualitative um, research where we asked the there was nine participants all together and they all each of them had um, a coaching session with Julie that lasted maybe an hour and a half. Um, and at the end of all the sessions, they were asked to questions like to what extent did the telephone walking coaching in uh, help you deal or cope with the current pandemic. And you can imagine you can remember at that time how much anxiety people had. Um, so these are some of the, the quotes. So coaching while walking and on the phone meant that I could stay within my radius at peak lock, lockdown and be outside in the fresh air and have all the benefits of one-to-one -one coaching without any social distancing issues. And I was walking more during the lockdown, but it was at times isolating. So it helped to connect with someone, but also to work on something positive rather than just to chat. Um, and it was wonderful to have that kind of support and encouragement during a stressful time and to focus on something that I was really excited about. And we asked them about what influence did the walking coaching have on their energy levels. We didn't measure that in the previous study. And we found that actually energy seems to be one of the things that, that walking coaching really taps into. And so as you can see there, all of them said it was either extremely effective or very effective. Um, and then we asked them about the extent to which uh, moving made a difference. So the physical movement of walking and moving forward helped my thoughts flow. And the physicality of walking and talking at the same time also means that you feel more energized. So they're all interconnected, as you can see. So walking helped me think and increase my moods by stimulating endorphins. Um, and it, uh, yes, so in terms of creativity, it, as you can see there, it was a little bit more mixed. For some, it was really effective. Uh, for some, less effective. And again, this is a, it's quite a small sample, obviously. Um, but very clear in terms of energy and quite clear in terms of mood, if we look at the next slide, that people really benefited from uh, the walking coaching. Uh, the last one was well-being. Yeah, so a few said moderately effective. And I think we have a few more quotes on. Yeah, so it's sorry. 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 <laughs> So in terms of being outside, it was so refreshing getting away from the desk and having the space to think outside with nature, which I think is really interesting uh, to consider because it's almost like going for a walk outside in nature has become a luxury uh, when, when we live the kind of lifestyle that we're living. So it's definitely less confining than being in a room and somehow freeing. And being outside in a beautiful environment helps to focus the mind. It takes you away from what could be a stressful environment. Um, so just going to points of discussion and recommendations. Now, this is quite a short um, presentation, but it, hopefully you'll get a sense of the, the effects of walking coaching in terms of both experience and effects. So they seem to be really beneficial in general 
to the participants that we studied. Um, all of them felt that it was either extremely or very effective in terms of increasing their energy and also their mood. Um, but the studies are really small uh, in terms, so they're more pilot studies and they're, you know, they, they basically need to be repeated and we need to have larger samples. Uh, and this is actually what we're moving towards, developing a kind of a, a more rigorous research to look at the effects of, of walking coaching. And yeah, so the, to fight and to finish. Yeah, coaching while walking, why not check it out or check out the benefits with your clients if you haven't tried it before? Then this is our way of getting people active and obviously it's beneficial for both you and your coachee. So give it a go. So just wanted to say thank you very much for listening. And obviously if you've got any questions for either myself or Zelda, we'd be delighted to take your questions now. Uh, awesome, ladies. Thank you so much. Uh, super interesting. A um, couple of questions in, in the chat. Um, I might start off with one of my own. Any reading or books that you'd recommend in particular? Where do we find out more? There isn't a huge amount of uh, reading in relation to coaching and um, physical activity. Um, but there's, there's, there's several books that I've read myself in relation to the benefits of movement in relation to coaching, uh, in relation to creativity and solution focused thinking and what I can do uh, Jason if it's okay with you I can probably send you a list um, I'm just looking at the list here but I can send those to you or put them on the chat so the things that I'd recommend I'm just looking down here is the real happy pill which is the pa power up your brain by moving your body by a guy called Anders Hansen mm -hmm. Spark is a really interesting book by John Ratley called um what's called Spark by John Radley. Uh, the Joy of Movement by Kenny, Kelly McGonagall. Uh, you might have come across her. And In Praise of Walking is actually by an Irish uh, professor, Shane O'Mara. Quite a detailed book, but lots, lots of benefits detailed in that book in relation to the benefits of walking. So there, there's a few and I can send them to you, Jason. Um, awesome, so thank you, you so much. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely forward them on to people. Um, awesome. Um, Carmel asks, she was wondering what the coachy or what you guys feel the con the, the coachy consciously leaves behind when they set off for the walk. So it's a very nice question. What they leave behind. Mm. Um, well, do you want me to answer that, Zelda? Or? Yeah. Uh, so I, I, well, I suppose without asking them, I'm not sure, but I guess what they leave behind is a stress. Um, because what I tend to find with myself and the coaches I'm working with, then they're in the moment. Um, because obviously we're talking through their barrier phones and they're out in nature. And because obviously with the physical movement, the endorphins are, are pumping through their body, that I think they leave their stress behind and they feel energised and motivated and to, and to come back to their desk and actually tackle what, whatever is in front of them that, on that day. Okay. I, hope that, I hope that answers the question. Awesome, yeah. Um, some, some more practical questions, which I suppose I'd be very interested in myself as well, but I suppose in terms of the practicalities, what about bad weather? Yeah, bad weather's not an easy one, is it? And to be truthful, yeah, bad weather does affect, I mean, and obviously if you're coaching in Ireland, then we do get a lot of rain. I have to say, if it's pouring with rain, then I tend to have to, it has to be rescheduled. Um, I don't mind walking in the rain as, and as long as you've got, you know, you've got the right walking gear on. Um, it's fine, but it's if it's obviously not, if the client doesn't want to go out in the rain, then it, it's just literally a case of rescheduling, rescheduling it for another time. I suppose that is one of the disadvantages and we can't control the weather, unfortunately, even though we'd like to. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that question was from Gary. That's a really good question. Um, it could be interesting to be starting to put people up in treadmills <laughs> and see if that works. Yeah, um, I've thought about that yet. Yeah. Really nice question from Nicola Porter. Do you miss taking notes from either your perspective or the client's perspective? That's a, that's a great question. Um, when I'm when, not with the telephone coaching, as in when I'm working remotely with them, but when I uh, pre-COVID and we were walking side by side, um, I, I personally hold those thoughts in my mind and I'll take the notes. Um, if I've driven to the place that I'm walking, I'll, I'll make the notes there and then when I get in the car. But with the client, I tend to, what they tend to do is actually put their actions in their phone so that they're capturing them there and then and they've made a note of them for themselves. But I would obviously have to wait until an appropriate time when I can write those notes. Okay. Yeah. I think that's right. Voice memos on the phone can be really- Oh yes, yeah, absolutely. Voice memos, we've done that before. Okay. 
Um, and we'll go with one more, if that's okay. Uh, just wondering if any of your walking coaching was other than in green spaces. Wondering if the same benefit is felt if you're walking in a streetscape or an urban situation. Will I answer that, Nelda, is that okay? Yeah. yeah. Um, I always try and walk in, um, well, I suppose from an insurance perspective, I try not to walk near traffic or on roads. So I try to find somewhere that is flat so that people aren't sort of, they might stumble. So a flat walkway, which is safe. Um, I have walked in urban areas. I, I did some work with an organization who did some walking coaching. Um, and I think it wasn't as beneficial because obviously with the, the, the traffic, it was quite noisy. So there is some benefits, but I think there are more benefits from walking in a, you know, an environment which is next to nature or in trees or near, near the sea, uh, but, but, but quieter than an urban setting. Yeah, I think some of the, the people that we interviewed as well mentioned this. So if they were in the city, the organizational setting one, um, there were people that felt that it was a bit distracting and you had to look out you know, when you're crossing the road. So finding a space that's safe and knowing where you're going, I think can help. Um, yeah, because it can be quite distracting. Okay. Actually, uh, we, we did publish a paper on this, and I put it on the link. The difference between what please, that'll be that will be awesome. Uh, there is a couple of messages for you guys in the chat as well, guys. So maybe have a look through. Uh, just somebody wants to get in touch with you about doing some more research. Great. Um, we'll go one more question, and then we'll move on to Mary, if that's okay. So one question is: Had the clients previously experienced coaching in a more traditional environment? And I'll give you an add on to that as well is does the where people are placed so does this is the side by side interaction important or is it any different when you're on the phone and walking with them in terms of your experience with it. So to answer the first question, um, most people I've worked with who've gone from sitting in an office, you know, um, having a coaching session to walking. I'm not going to say because there's no research on this, but anecdotally, their preference is the walking coaching. They, most people seem to love it. Um, and your second question was, sorry, Jason, it's just gone. Out sorry, of I probably shouldn't have thrown two questions at you. No, once sorry, really. The second question was any difference between being beside the oh, yes. client yes. or okay. on the phone? Yeah. Sorry, I don't know how I did, why I didn't hold that in my head. So it's actually really interesting. When you're walking with a client, they actually find it very liberating because some some actually, some clients don't actually like that face to face or that eye to eye contact so the walking by by the side feels as if you're an ally and they appear to actually be able to speak more freely because actually you're not looking at them so it seems to be very freeing um and obviously you're walking side by side and you're walking forward figure you know you're you're moving forward and you're also figuratively moving towards your goals um, with some of the feedback I got and in relation to the to the telephone coaching because I felt myself perhaps that wouldn't be as beneficial but actually again the people I worked with said you know it's nice to be there with you Julie but actually again it's very freeing I can't see you and that's that's not a problem actually because I'm thinking out loud whilst I'm walking and again very freeing and very liberating so yeah, those, 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 that's the feedback I got from the clients I've worked with in, in, in relation to those questions. Excellent. Um, thank you so much for that, ladies. That was fantastic. I think the question and answers at the end as well kind of really, I suppose, opened it up a little bit. Um, our next speaker, uh, if it's okay, ladies, I might ask you to stop sharing too. Thanks very much. Uh, so our next sorry, speaker- Sorry, Jason, just one thing. If people want to sort of connect with us on LinkedIn as a way of connecting, then please do this, yeah. Happy to, happy to do that. Okay. Sorry. What if you'd like, what I can do, guys, is I'll share the LinkedIn and the email afterwards with the slides and, and all that kind of stuff. So if people want to connect. Um, okay. So our next speaker is Mary Vallette Devine, who is a HR consultant with over 20 years' experience delivering large scale projects in the utility sector. Mary uh, has run Mary D Consultancy since 2013 and recently co authored the book Leadership Transition Coaching. And Mary will be sharing the research approach and findings that forms the basis of this book. I'll hand you over to Mary. Jason, one sec here now. No problem, take your time. 
And Mary, just to let you know, we're a little bit behind time, but you take your time and we'll let the, the Q&A at the end run over, but take your time to your presentation. That's my fault, okay? Okay, yeah. One sec, yeah. Okay. We got it okay, Jason? Perfect, yep. Yeah. Lovely, very good. Hello to everyone, and thank you for the opportunity actually here to speak at the PSI. Um, I know Zelda and Julie and Jason from the master's program, let's say, down in UCC. And look, I want to thank everybody again for the opportunity to, to speak here on the subject here today. Okay, the topic, I suppose, has, is leadership transition coaching, and it's been a bit of a journey actually on this one. Um, for me, it was, it was probably my second time retiring in life, actually, when I, by the time I arrived at this juncture here and took on that master's program. And I think it was the, the head was still moving at a pace. But uh, no, it was a wonderful opportunity to be able to attend the, the university for the year. And really, my interest at the time was the research, purely research um, that I could obtain, let's say, through that master's program. I was interested in the impact of coaching and leaders at the transition to a new role. My own background has been in the world of, suppose, of business and working in large organizations and then setting up my own business. So this was a key question for me, what could it be? So that was my big why. And in that journey, I suppose, what also influenced it was, I was very conscious of, and have been very conscious, they learned very much of the influence of leaders in the world, let's say, the influence in organizations, even on the teams that they lead. Um, it's about building teams, it's about the organizations that they lead and the wider society in general. So we can only have to think about the world we're in today and the leadership and the impact of that and the big and the decisions that are made and how we go. So two was the pace of change. And it was about navigating that change. And really it was about for new leaders moving into a new role, it is about navigating the transition. Um, and I'll talk in a second about, about what that transition might look like. It's also about adaptation at an accelerated uh, rate because it is paced and, and not alone that pace, but the ambiguity and the sit of situations that people are kind of uh, meeting as moving to new roles. Their own expectations, considering that, you know, it's quite exciting to get a new role, but equally well, as we move into that journey of the new role, how kind of little doubts can come about or can get triggered about previous um, patterns of our own behavior. So it's considering that and also the anticipation, the expectation of others as well to take on the new role. So I suppose personally as well, it was about the impact of coaching, as I've mentioned, and the research allowed an evidence-based approach, which I think is still with the world of coaching, there's a, 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 it's an it's evolutionary stage still. So it's maybe contributing to that. And for me, it's very much about people. Um, all my work in the past has been very much in organizations, kind of working in organizational development, different aspects of human resources. In latter years, then more as a coach and a mentor, and even back to being a student again, which has been amazing. And I continuously meet that student cycle along the way. Just to mention, maybe as, as I carried out the research, I found evidence along the way of leader derailments of up to 50% within 18 months. Now that range can go from 30 to 60%, depending on the studies, various studies out there. But on average, they said up to 50% within 18 months. What does derailment mean? It can mean, let's say, that the person might decide to leave the organization. Uh, they just, their role may be terminated or they may continue to stay there, but the career can plateau. I did mention about transition, what it is. It's not an event. So when somebody gets a role as such, you know, it's not just a matter of leaving the door, one office on a Friday or a location or whatever, a team um, and just arriving up and th the following week, maybe in a new role. It's, it's got a three way process. It's about the leaving piece. It's, it's, it's a piece in itself. It's, there's a central piece then of the unknown, getting to know where your new, what your new territory is and getting a sense of what you know and what you don't know and what you, you need to know maybe. And then there is a piece of me feeling more comfortable again. Coaching often falls into that middle piece and that middle ground. So that's been the big why, I suppose, and, and some pieces I found along the way. Uh, research participants, just to give you a bit of background, I'm conscious of the fact that the audience here today, a lot of people will carry their own, their own research, plenty of it. But for me, I was a student and it was my first time coming into the world of research. Um, even though I haven't been involved in organizations and surveys and many different engagements and stuff, the research to this piece was very, very different for me and was very disciplined, I would say as well. So the participants um, I focused on, well, I got access to really eight leaders, eight senior leaders in organizations um, who had very big remits actually in the, the organizations. I mean, some leaders would have had, you know, they're globally leading teams of nine teams over global um, locations as such. Um, and one leader actually was in a location who had 300 on their team 
Um, and they had been the fifth leader in the, in the space of two years to come on to lead that team. So that individual is going through a transition as much as the team that they're leading. So it's quite significant, the concept of transition. Sectors I looked at were public sector. There were three leaders in that direction and five in the private sector. And the, utility, and the industries then were, came from utilities, banking, telecoms and drinks. I did carry out late, so this, this, the interviews carried out in 2017. Um, and since then, actually, we've, I've arrived, the research has arrived into a book, and I'll share that along the way. But just to say that in 2020, when COVID hit then, and the pandemic, I should say, that I interviewed further leaders, and those, their feedback is in the book as such. So the methodology was qualitative research. I carried out semi-structured interviews, 15 questions. So a lot of questions, I must say, but I, Realized I probably asked too many, but I got a lot of information. That maybe is why it's arrived in the book as well. They're all audio recorded and a lot of coding and thematic analysis, what I used. The findings at the end of the day were four main themes, um, which also had some sub themes, and I'll share them with you. And that's the framework. They formed the framework, really. Um, and just to say, ultimately, really, the pearls, uh, uh, the wisdom, I suppose, can be found through the voice of the leaders. And for me, that was where, as much as the teams give it, they're like, signposts along the way to what leaders can be working through in transition but the the words and the way they say it and they, it, it really is where the pearls of, of the, the research is and finally just to say also it's not a one-size-fits-all so even in this framework when you look at the framework it to me ultimately it came to me at some point it's a catalyst for conversation and let the leaders look at it and let them something resonate with them but it's not a one-size-fits-all when we look at this at the framework but it definitely is a catalyst for conversation so the research participants, five uh, males and three females, and they were heads of function, our global heads of function, um, our global director, and they went from anything from four, year, four years leadership experience to 20. Now I'm saying that even the person here with the four years experience had possibly 20 years behind him in the organization prior to even arriving at the global head of function. They were kind of catapulted into that role. And that particular individual had nine direct reports in, in nine global locations. So it's quite diverse, really. Um, so the data analysis, just to give an insight in there, I know you'll all be probably, a lot of you will be familiar with this, but the transcribing and the coding, I carried that out and um, it took quite some time, but worth doing and worth listening to the way things were said as well, and the emphasis that was put on the various aspects of the research of the data. Analyzing that data, looking for patterns, reading and rereading the data, uh, and reflexivity was continuous throughout, because one of the things I was very conscious of was not bringing my own influence of where I was coming from in terms of the business world I worked in and to try to keep that data um, as clean as possible. And Inga, Inga Neustraten, Inga, you're out there, I'm sure, listening to me maybe today, but Inga was a research supervisor um, for me. And also, as we went through the book as well, so she's the co-author on the book and Inga was very much um, in there as well on all of that journey of the supervision. So research supervision, and also then the research later was peer reviewed as I went to deliver the research um, to the EMCC research conference in 2019 and its publication after that. And equally when later, when the book was published in, on the journey of that in 2019 and 20, and that book was published in 21. So Inga has been very much a part of the journey with me on this and also the co-author um, on the book. So the four main findings, um, the four themes, um, Time to think, how important that is. And, you know, just listening to the previous presentation there, you know, that thinking piece is so important, the quality of the thinking. If we process roughly 70,000 thoughts a day, it's a lot of thoughts. So it's the quality of those thoughts and the conversations. And I think as well, back to Julian Zelda, you know, that walking piece is important because it's partnering as well. It's the physicality of partnering with somebody and you're a partner with them. You're not any more powerful than they are, but you're there to facilitate something. And there's something in the psychology of that. Clarity and focus, number two, um, the second thing. And how important is that? You know, when you get so much information, such a busy world, 24 seven, and so many stakeholders and teams and your own people um, liaising with you. Then collaborate with others, very, very important because in today's organization, the command and control isn't as um, relevant as, as it was in the past. The world has changed. And that collaborating with others, other experts, other expertise, your team members, Getting everybody on board and um, working together is really key. And development, development of the individual because they've arrived here now, they've had a journey to arrive at this point, but they're in new territory and it is about looking at where you're at now and what you can bring with you and what you may need to leave behind you as well. 
and self-awareness, of course, coming in there very much so, but I'll expand on that now further in a second. So the first theme, time to think. So these are the sub-themes. And these are the wordings really that are kind of coming through to me as I looked at and analyzed the data. I spent a lot of time on the analysis of the data. I ended up with 72 Excel sheets at one point. I had 970 lines of data on the, on the sheet and um, it, it, it was a big piece. It was crazy really, but look, at it arrived where it was and I wanted to give it a best shot of what I could do to, um, to get this data. But I'm, I'm confident that this is um, giving um, substance, I suppose, to the voice of those leaders because that's really where it, it, um, the, the, the value is. So the second one then was the first one, um, sorry, finding your feet in a new dynamic. It is quite different moving into a new space. It's a different time. It's a different context. You have new people. So it's quite different. Secondly, discipline or reflecting to create value in a very busy world. So people, let's say, want, it is busy time and they want to get some quick wins and they want to look at the longer term plans and the vision as well for where they're moving towards. They also said the impact was, it was stretching as was their thinking and assumptions and they were getting more challenged. They were just, you know, as much as coaching is supportive, it's all, it also needs to be challenging. It needs to kind of open up new possibilities and maybe, you know, consider what's happening in a wider sense. Creating space to think and plan to develop the vision and direction because it is about thinking. I mean, leaders come into roles and it is about looking where are we now, where are we moving forward to, what are we going to change here, what needs to be changed. And it's not as much as the inside part of an organization is changing and influences there, but equally well, the external world is changing and there's impacts there. And that's very evident in our own world today and with so much happening in the external world. So how is that impacting? And looking and trying to build direction forward. Widening the lens with critical thinking to explore challenges and opportunities. Yes, there will be challenges, but equally well, there'll be opportunities and what you need to look at there. That's the first one. So that's time to think. Moving on forward then in clarity and focus, what did that look like? So this became, I suppose, the trust, the psychologically safe environment with trust and openness. At a time when a leader is moving, the expectations are high all around and the person has is, is, you know, been successful. So it's finding that space now because there are some vulnerabilities there. Confidence can dip as you move into a new space as well. Um, because you're in unknown territory to a point. So it can little dip. That's for males and females alike. So the second piece then was about having the opportunity to download and get structure on the issues. Really, really important because it is about with so much going on um, and gathering so much information um, from different sources, how we can get into a room or take a walk even with somebody now, this day, Julie and Zelda, um, and have a look at what, what's happening right now. And what are the issues and putting some structure on it. Broadening perspective by developing a wider lens. So it's getting a, more, a wider perspective. Our, expect, our perspective is very much I suppose, linked back to our own previous experience in life. So, you know, it is about building new experiences and understanding how we might walk into those experiences. So building a wider perspective and wider lens. Operating at the right level for impact and influence. Technically speaking, you've moved into a new role. So your identity does change some little what. And it's to consider that. Who am I now? You know, who are my stakeholders? Who are my teams? Who, who, what's my role here? Um, and how will I have the impact and influence there? Um, so it's considering that. Getting clarity and focus on priorities and developing a plan. So at a time when you're, you're gathering a lot, you're quite active um, and it's moving forward at a pace because the world is quite ex accelerated out there. What, are my, what can be the priorities? Developing a plan towards that. Okay. And this is an important one here, I think, with the coaching as well, holding us accountable to ourselves and the coach holding us accountable maybe as well. But it's that check-in to review and revise. Where am I now? Where, where did I set out from? Where am I now? And where am I moving towards? Am I still moving in the direction I thought I was moving? Have I gone outside? Do I need to do something else? Do I need to connect with some other people to bring them on board? So it's considering all of that. And working smart and sustaining focus and energy. So there's a lot to be done. So it is about saying, well, well, how can I work smart and sustaining focus and energy? I think this is important for resilience because you don't want to burn out either. You don't want to burn yourself out. You don't want to burn your team out. So it is about checking in with people as well and just looking at how we can work smarter, whether that's managing our time differently, whether it's sharing more resources or less resources. So it's considering that. So that was number two. Third team, collaborate with others. 
So collaborate with your new leadership team. A lot of the leaders were so senior, let's say, that they had other leaders, maybe three to four other senior leaders reporting into them. And as they arrived, the need to, I suppose, ascertain um, what were the visions or what were the plans or what were the strategies that the other leaders were working on. There were different functions, let's say. So the more senior you go, you're more functions reporting into you. And it was about um, developing one vision. Where are we now in the business? What's happening? Is, am I bought in here for a particular reason, but what in here to develop some change program or whatever it might be or transform the organization, downsize it or upsize it or whatever, or merge into new markets even. The second one was flexing the approach for the leader. It's important to consider this, that for effective interactions and engagement, to consider the different personalities you're going to meet and how you adapt to that and your different styles, whether they be your stakeholders or the teams that you're going to lead. That's an important one. Um, and then navigating the journey with the team and bring them on board. Any leader, really, at the end of the day, you know, it is about, you know, it's about leading people, but it's also having followers. It's about do people want to follow you? Um, because the, the, the title and the song won't allow, won't just, it's a given that that's going to happen. So it is about understanding that and, and working with your team and bringing them on board um, to, to work as a team. Uh, today, of course, in the world too of coaching, team coaching is so important because it is about building the team. The individual on their own is not, it's not possible to, to kind of lead out all the change or the, to meet the objectives you want in an organization. It is about the team. That's how you get there. So it's about setting expectations then and having some performance conversations. Um, it doesn't have to be awfully formal. Some organizations, as, you know, it, it tends to be, but it is about getting clear about what the deliverables are and expectations there. But I think just support in there as well. It's about understanding of what can be the challenges as well there. So leaders become the coaches themselves in organizations and it's a have an appreciation of that too um, and how that can move forward. Building new relationships and networks, um, be it with your peers, a new peer group you might have, other stakeholders within the organization or outside the organization, or maybe even political networks or whoever. But yeah, you've, you've, so to consider that, and yes, this is a piece here, a stakeholder plan, developing that or identifying that early. Uh, one of my clients would have said that this was an opportunity to step back, consider the stakeholder plan and who, they, who the stakeholders are, because when they actually sat down and looked at the a lot more stakeholders than they thought that they had. So just considering that, and I mean, that's really coming back to collaboration too, in a way, you know. So development, um, that was the fourth theme. And this is back as comes into this was, well, who am I as a leader or how will I be as a leader? So it's developing the potential and confidence by tapping into the inner resources. Um, that confidence that I had mentioned earlier on does dip. So it's looking at where, where am I now? It's also looking at strengths. And I think that's, you know, an interesting one because Strengths are something we can tap into that kind of we inherently have them, but it's also not overplaying strengths because they can derail you too. So it's being mindful of that. Um, but it is tapping into those resources, maybe even learning from earlier parts of experiences in your earlier part of your career, your life, and not tripping yourself up in places where you know you might have learned um, things from. So as you move forward to be at your best, it is about, I suppose, meaning, purpose, and values. Um, very powerful in the context of well, why am I here? What am I, you know, what's to meet the, the purpose of my role? What's the purpose of the business that you're working for? Your values, we bring up, the values are a core part of who we are. How do they align with the organization that we work in? Do they sometimes, you know, conflict with it? Um, and how we manage that space. So some bit of exploratory work and that can be useful. Um, sourcing feedback mechanism for personal stretch and growth. One of the leaders did say that he really did think he was doing the right thing and he was showing up and show, you know, and, and engaging the way he thought was kind of productive. But he said on the feedback 360, it, it wasn't having the impact. So he said, again, he was going to realize that he needed to make further changes and that he would do a 360 in another few months again. But um, so that's to understand that, we, that, that those 360s and the feedback loops are very important as well. Identify your own authentic, authentic leadership approach. So who am I as a leader? Um, and how will I, how do I want to be remembered as a leader? And what's the piece that I can, that can, can make a difference to me in the role that I'm looking at? So, and then develop others' potential, empowerment of autonomy of the team. A lot of, some leaders will arrive because of their own competence and their own success in the previous roles that they've held. Um, at the end of the day, moving into leadership roles and more as you more move into more senior roles, it is about empowering and others and giving them autonomy and supporting them because 
It is about growing leaders for the future. It's a, the leadership pipeline. It's about letting go and delegating. And that's really key, especially if you've got a strong expertise or a kind of um, a, a functionality approach in the past that you're the expert in a specific area or a function. Um, it's about that letting go and delegating. And that's an uncomfortable space, but it's the place to consider and try letting go. And over time, um, you'll grow then the team that need to grow um, that report to you. Gaining new insights as leaders went along the journey of the coaching. They got some new insights along the way. They, got, they referred to them as light, some of them as light bulb moments. So there was new insights. Um, and then career, managing from here to the future. I'll predict one particular leader in the, in the um, research who actually had just arrived here, but was really more anxious to get onto the next role. It was a stepping stone. So it was about how do we engage them and hold them at a point in time whereby they can fruitfully, I suppose, um, be that leader for the period of time that they're going to be there. But equally well, they had a career ambitions to move forward. So some of the leaders look very, very ambitious and want to move forward, so stepping stone. But think about it, because at the end of the day, if a, if a leader is fundamentally, if it's about their career and that getting this job done is about their career, you know, it is about asking the question, well, what about the rest of the team you're going to lead um, and the impact of that? Because people will see the wood from the trees and think in the longer term and say, this is all about you. For an effect, is it about the business? Is it about what we, our purpose here and um, doing the better good, I suppose, really? So sustainable learning then, taking some of the action learning that they have got through the coaching scenarios, let's say, um, interventions, and taking some of that learning um, and bring it into the role. So it's, it's typically touching on, again, the fact that the leaders kind of take on some of the coaching skills as well themselves and can use some of the tools and techniques of their own team and engage them. So there were the four main themes. Um, these were the sub themes. And then just coming down very quickly here into discussion, some of the items would be that it's not a one size fits all. So leaders exhibited individual differences and an emphasis on the different aspects of the coaching. So it's not one size. However, there was a consensus in some aspects. The first one was a unique space for the trust, the trust with the leaders. That's what the, building that tr trust is important. And it allows them then to bring themselves fully into the room and share whatever they need to share or take that walk and share whatever you need to, to share. The second aspect is around getting the best out of relationships, relationships within the organization, which are peers, your teams um, or your stakeholders, um, because it's getting what you're working with others, you're collaborating. Third one is about self-awareness and the leader developing their own authentic leadership approach. Who do they want to be as a leader? How will they want to be remembered? And the findings aligned with fight was, was for me, going back over the years, I came into the world of coaching as touched off in about in 2003. And, you know, back in those days, I looked at various um, people, but I suppose Jonathan Passmore is one of the ones that um, I'd come across. But back then, even looking at I carried out the research, he would have indicated that coaching back in 2010 would cont does contribute to the leadership development in a number of ways. And I'll give a reference on that. The four teams and the subordinate teams really are a lens that can be useful for the stake for relevant stakeholders to consider if making transitions. So for yourselves, if you're making a transition, maybe there's something here for to consider, or if you know somebody out there or your, you know, other leaders and stuff like that. So I really would like this information, I suppose the research to be shared as much as possible. That's why I'm here today, actually, just to share it out there. And because it has had a strategic impact for the leaders. Um, and I'm thinking now more than ever in the world, you know, leaders have had that journey. I've worked with leaders who have told me that they didn't sleep properly for two years. And that's gone back many years ago. And um, there was just so much happening for them. And they didn't have support to sink or swim. It was kind of match or just get up there and get on with it. So I'm thinking just some of those converse coaching conversations for your walking, sitting, whatever, you know, that they, they can be quite powerful. And you're sharing, you're sharing something as well, I think, in the world and that partnering. So this is the book. Um, I delivered the research in 2019 at the MCC Research Conference. And from that came the opportunity to write, uh, an opportunity to write the book. So it was published in 2021 with um, McGraw-Hill Open University. And Inga, of course, was very much with me um, as we went that journey. Um, in the book, actually, there is much more content in the book in terms of you have the team, sub themes, and I put in some questions as well in the context of what might be helpful. They're not prescribed, but they're there just as an indicator that might be useful for someone to think about. But ultimately, the, all the teams and sub teams are supported by the voice of the leaders and the quotes that they, from their work, my interviews, I should say, with them. And that really is where the value of it is. Additional reading, Jason, you mentioned earlier on, is there anything we could share? So I've just put in some articles here. You can pick them up on Google Scholar. 
somebody did reach out to me recently on the book here, Tom Kenny uh, reached out. Um, he, they've just himself um, and Robin Middlehurst in the UK have completed uh, or published a book this year at Rutledge and Rutledge, I should say, and it's on uh, leadership transitions in universities. And I've bought, got the book, got into it, just got into it. And yes, it's, I, I would recommend it. Um, again, it's back to transitions and the word, the, the voice of the leaders. So just to say, thank you for listening. Uh, contact details are there. And Jason, I've offered to share with you the, um, and with the, all the attendees actually as well, the slides if they're of any value to anyone. Awesome, Mary, thank you so much. Um, it looks like a super useful model, uh, frantically taking notes. I really look forward to uh, reading that book and, and getting my hands on a signed copy maybe. A um, couple of questions for you. The book one I was going to ask, but that's kind of covered. Um, sorry now, there was one around assessments, yes. So were there any assessments you use to help the leads or the leaders to discover their leadership style or their strength or their values so I'm supposed to go in a bit more to yeah. detail in terms yeah, of when i'm working with some of the leads some of the leaders not with them all let's say but if somebody wants to be, delve into that area does the values the v, yeah I, I, I have a values exercise that i carry out with them right um and i would also use the gallops the top five strengths with gallop um i have used in the past for assessment purposes as well i use let's say the uh, mars briggs step two um and the emotional intelligence EQI um, reports as well. So various ones depending, you know? Okay, so it was, you didn't have a particular, uh, it, it was on need. Oh, absolutely, yeah. You see, the, it's always the, the coach, the, the client's agenda, that's the way I look at it. So I, I'm, I don't go in with a frame of reference. It, it's very important to stay open to the client and what their needs are and what they want from it. Some, with, in terms of presence even, because the presence of the client is, is important, to match that presence as well is important. The, the client may sometimes want to come in and achieve, very clear about what they want to achieve. And we have that conversation, then we partner with them on that. But then there might be other areas that we'll touch on as we go the journey, but it, it's always the client's agenda. Okay, very good. Mary, just to let you know, you probably haven't had a chance to look at some really nice kind words in the chat for you as well. Uh, people love it and a lot of people looking forward to getting their hands on that book. OK, we're a little over time. I'm very sorry. I'll, I'll have to take responsibility for that, I'm afraid. But um, what we're going to do now, if people want and if people have time, um, we're going to open up breakout rooms uh, just to let, I suppose, people mingle a little bit. So I'm going to just open up breakout rooms randomly. I'm going to put three people in each room. Um, I'll take a few minutes and I'll, you know, because they, it mightn't uh, kind of work exactly evenly. So it might take a minute for all three people to enter your room. Um, and it's just to give people a chance to mingle and, and talk and, and, and meet each other. So I suppose that with in-person events, I always found that was one of the nicer things about it, the, the coffee and tea uh, before and afterwards. Um, so I'm going to do that. I'm going to hold the rooms for about 30 minutes in total. Um, and I suppose something came up about this that people might be a little uh, unsure of what to say to each other, sorry now, uh, initially. And so my screen's going a bit crazy. I'm really not having a good day with the tech today. Uh, so a couple of topics, if you might want to talk about any interesting projects or research you're involved in yourself, any interesting upcoming events, or any good coaching books that you're currently reading or have read. So I'm gonna open those up. So if you wanna stay, uh, just hang on. And if you wanna pop off, I suppose now will be the time. And I'd just like to say thanks so much for the huge turnout. Uh, it's been really, really nice. And thanks for all the kind words to the speakers, etc. Thanks particularly to Zelda, Julie and Mary. Uh, that was awesome. Thanks for making that first one happen for me. Uh, I appreciate people move stuff around and, and everything for me. So I'm very appreciative.